Hello folks and welcome to the uh, third of my uh, series of short videos about growing up with undiagnosed autism. Uh, it's a bit of a, a recap and the first two videos I discussed uh, early childhood and then later childhood and youth and uh, all the way up to um, going to university at the end of my 20s and then finally graduating. Um, at 31 actually I was, not 30 as I said in the earlier vid. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to recap really on that period up to then and talk about some of the issues looking back now that I realise uh, were would have been indicators of autistic spectrum condition had that kind of thing uh, been understood and able to be diagnosed at that time. Uh, social communication was the principal one. Uh, I was quite astonished when I first started working care nearly 20 years ago and did some training about communication to learn that uh, verbal communication is actually only about 7% of total communication. I'd always presumed it was the major form. Uh, and so I was surprised to, to learn that it was all, uh, the, the most of it was uh, the non-spoken communication, uh, body language, gestures, expressions, uh, and that kind of thing, and which I'd never really uh, conned on to. I, I understood extremes obviously I knew if somebody was very angry and I knew if somebody was very upset and I knew if somebody was uh, you know laughing hysterically uh, what kind of mood that they were in but uh, the in-between stuff um, I couldn't gauge very well I'd always had problems with making eye contact uh, I could never do it I always felt very uncomfortable with it and in fact uh, several job interviews that I've had over the years um, in some of the feedback that I've received I've been told uh, one of the issues that came up um, if I hadn't got the job was inability to maintain eye contact with the interviewer uh, but uh, I, I I kind of learned from that that yeah it, it, I, I, I was aware that it was an issue and I, I was aware that uh, it was understood generally in society to show that you were untrustworthy in some way um, but uh, I it, it, that wasn't the case with me it was just something that made me profoundly uncomfortable and I suppose eye contact is the eyes are the windows of the soul as they say eye contact is something that is so important in that kind of communication but yes body language uh, gestures expressions they were things that I missed uh, and I relied mainly on the spoken word um, when I was, uh, this may be unrelated to autism, it could be related to it, I don't know, but when I was in my, oh I suppose early teens, even before then, I exhibited um, several obsessive compulsive traits, uh, counting in particular, if I, I would go out in the street, and this is something that carried on into later life and something that I still do to some extent, counting the steps, um, and uh, I... I was also obsessed with things like taps, uh, the kitchen sink taps or the bath taps or the basin taps and light switches. Uh, I needed to turn them on and off, on and off, in order to, uh, if I was leaving a room for instance, ensure that the off condition, the light was there, very definitely off. And I'd shut the door and then I'd have to go back and check and switch it on again and switch it off again. Um, several times and the taps I had to turn them on and turn them off to make sure that they were off and I could sometimes spend long periods of time uh, with switches and taps it, it was quite stressful I suppose um, it made me quite anxious uh, the idea that I could come out of a room like the bathroom and close the door and then did I turn the taps off did I turn the light off and going back to check and then finding that I had done those things and then having to go back and check again and check again. I did this quite quite a number of times. That was one thing and 
I've, I've got, I'm not so bad with those kinds of things now, but yes, certainly counting, doing things like counting steps and, and uh, that, that kind of thing, if, if I'm out walking, is something that I still do. Uh, not out loud, unconsciously, I will count as I go along. Um, and, and in my early teens, I suppose uh, from about the age of 14, I had always been quite a messy and untidy child and quite a destructive child. Uh, I knew I caused problems at home. There, there was uh, incidents that I had where um, I could have caused a fire. I, I, I remember once I, I lit a firework underneath my bed. Um, I used to smash up my toys and uh, all my cars and I'd set fire to them. I'd, I'd steal matches and, and set fire to them to see what they looked like while they were burning, you know, as if it was a real accident going on. I, I, I was quite destructive in that way. And then around about the age of 14, I turned the other way completely and became obsessively tidy and ordered um, about the things that I was doing. I, I needed to have things in my room in a certain order. My books had to be in a certain order. I even devised a kind of library uh, indexing system, I suppose you would call it. I had a series of symbols that I would draw on the backs of my books so that I could differentiate them from fiction books, uh, factual books, dictionaries, that kind of thing. I, ha I had quite a lot of books at the time. Uh, and they had to be in a certain order, um, and they also had to be in an order of height as well. Um, other things that I had in my room, yeah, they had to be a, a certain way. I, I, I had a, a thing in my early childhood where I couldn't get to sleep at night unless the pillow was directly in the centre of the bed, and I used to have to move the pillow and check using the width of my hand to make sure that the width that side and the width that side so so the pillow was dead central and it had to be dead central if it was slightly that way or slightly that way and I would micro adjust several times until I was absolutely satisfied yes that that's it it's in the center of the bed so uh, that was an early thing that was in early childhood but uh, yes in, in, in my teens uh, from early teens up to uh, and onwards, the sense of order and uh, tidiness uh, and, and the meticulousness about things became very, uh, <clears throat> well, dominant in my life. I would get very anxious. My, my father was quite an untidy man. Um, he would do things like, uh, if ever we had a car, we didn't have cars very often, but he, you know, he, he'd smoke in the car, he'd put his matches on the floor, he'd, he'd, he'd put his cigarette ends on the floor. Um, he didn't mind if there was mud in the car or dirt or anything like that. And he would go in the bathroom and have his wash, and I would wait anxiously for him to finish and then go in there after he'd finished and have to clean everything. Clean the basin, um, uh, wipe it around. He often used to smoke in the bathroom and he'd put his cigarette on the edge of the basin or on the edge of the bath and, and it would leave a little brown stain so I'd have to go around and wipe it all down. And I was the same with my mother if she used the bathroom. It would have to be in a certain order. I'd need it to look uh, clean and I'd need it to look straight and yes as I said that 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 um, extended into other areas of my life I was the same with my car if, if I had a car I didn't like people um, traveling in it other people traveling in it and if they did travel in it I'd have to vacuum it out and clean it afterwards uh, again these may not be necessarily connected to autism but they were very dominant behaviors and they do persist to some uh, extent. When I first went for my referral uh, I had a visit from a specialist uh, who came to visit me at home and uh, I, at the time I had a motorbike and he, and he asked me um, do you ever take your motorbike out in the wet and I said no never. What happens if you take the motorbike out and it rains while you're out and then you have to come back and it's wet and I said oh, I have to clean it before I put it away right you know that's the sort of thing he was expecting here i was always obsessive about those kinds of things i had motorbikes in my youth so i always
clean them if they got dirty. I was cleaning my bike every day and polishing it up, and the same with cars, um, always cleaning them, always making them look tidy and, and feeling anxious if anyone else got in the car because I wasn't sure what kind of residue they might leave behind, you know, mud or dirt or, or something like that. Uh, so yeah, those, those behaviours were, were, were quite uh, dominant in my life. As I grew older and into my teens and twenties, I did what I thought other people were supposed to do, or what all, all the peers, people of my age around me were doing, and I used to go to nightclubs. I didn't particularly enjoy going to nightclubs because I never enjoyed parties. I didn't like par I didn't like meeting people that I didn't know. I didn't like the loud music. I didn't like having to try and make conversation when I, I never really knew what to say. You know, small talk has, had always been a problem for me. Uh, but I used to go to nightclubs uh, principally because I liked the music at the time. It was, this was in the early to mid 80s, so there was some great music. Um, and I would often go and stand with an expensive drink in my hand and look around and wonder at what was going on, you know, what, what, what the real attraction was with it all. Uh, I knew it was all about kind of um, mating ceremonies and meeting people. And it used to astonish me when I would stand on the sidelines and I'd see somebody over there and somebody over there who were quite apart and didn't seem to be connected with one another in any particular way, at some stage come together as if something had happened between them and they'd just been drawn together like, like two magnets. Um, and that again was an indication of how I was missing out on things like uh, eye contact. Um, expressions, um, the body language, um, it, it just it just never registered with me at all. I was in my late forties actually before a, a woman that I was seeing at the time uh, pointed out to me that I didn't get flirtation signals um, and it's true I didn't I and mean, even when she demonstrated you know what did you think this was or this or this or this I just thought it was you moving your hands or moving your feet I, um, or changing I don't know your expression it, it, it makes it, you feel like you're naive and gullible and stupid, but it's just something that didn't register with me at all. Um, it, it wasn't important. Again, it was the, it was the spoken word that was, you know, where where it was where it was at for me. Um, so yes, uh, I uh, those are the kind of indicators, I suppose, of things uh, that were. Um, going on, the problems that I had. Um, I'd had a few relationships in my um, uh, 20s, a couple of times, I, you know, I've been out with a, a few people, but nothing had ever really been very successful um, and they hadn't lasted very long. And again, it was, it was something that I kind of struggled with. Um, I had this sense in my head for many, many years, I would say <clears throat> from about my mid-teens right the way up through my thirties, of people saying something very distinct about me behind my back. And that was, he's a strange lad, that one. It was, it was there in my head. I, I just had this feeling. I was very conscious of the fact that I didn't seem to be like other people. I didn't seem to... Um, dressed the way they did. I, I, I liked to wear clothes that were comfortable to me. They weren't necessarily fashionable. Um, I didn't seem to like the things that other people my age um, seemed to like or, or thought that I should like. I never liked the idea of going to something like a gig or, or a festival. Um, no, no, no. I, could, I couldn't have done that kind of thing. I, I, I was quite happy staying at home. Uh, for, for much of the time. Um, and like I said, in my 20s, uh, I was making up for my lack of education. Um, I wanted to head somewhere with that. And uh, so I was, I was spending all my evenings and weekends in my room reading, learning things. I, I, I was learn, trying to learn the piano, um, languages. Um, I was, was not very successful at that, but, but catching up a lot of catching up, and, and these things did interest me. They began to interest me in a way that 
doing things that other people of my age were doing it didn't really particularly interest or bother me. <clears throat> um, and so I, I got to university and as I said in the second video I struggled there because I didn't have A levels, um, I didn't have the educational grounding that a lot of people had um, uh, and uh, you know the, the students 10 years younger than I were far better educated and understood things that I didn't so I had to find those things out. It was the same with the mature students, they were they had the worldly experience on top of uh, an educational grounding that I didn't have so I was I was stuck in a kind of a limbo um, and, and like I said I, I just had to to work very hard. I, I'd never read any Shakespeare which I had to do for my course uh, in English literature, I'd never read any Dickens all of the students um, who were on the course um, would obviously have done an English literature A level, uh, the younger students, um, so they'd all read Shakespeare. And I had to not only get to grips with the language of Shakespeare, the poetics um, and um, the formalities of the drama, the um, <clears throat> sense of what was going on, but I also had the historical uh, angle on it to, to bone up on as well. I had to learn about the periods of history that were being depicted because, again, I hadn't had any any of that learning. Um, and it was very, very, very hard work. I worked hours and hours a day for the entire three years. It got to a point sometimes where I just thought, I'm not going to make it, and I almost dropped out. But I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad I persevered. And what university did... Um, I'm going to say something that is considered heretical, I know, but I wasn't doing it to maximise my career potential or my income potential. I was doing it because I wanted an education. It was about education for education's sake. Um, I, I just felt the need to, to learn these things. Um, I, I, I'd always wanted to be a writer and, and, and English just seemed like a natural route for me to take. Uh, I also did uh, some uh, history co a history course in my second year, medieval, medieval third year medieval history course, uh, which uh, gave me a, a bit of, bit more of a grounding in history. Uh, and I did a moral philosophy course and that was important because it got me challenging ideas and preconceived notions that I might have had, um, things that I'd grown up. Um, I, I took a lot of my beliefs from my family, a lot of uh, the things, um, um, values obviously, but, but, but beliefs as well, political beliefs, uh, religious beliefs. And all of that was challenged for me. I, I began to ask questions about myself and what I believed and what I thought. And it kind of gave a, I suppose you'd say, an intellectual basis to stuff that I'd um, felt instinctively for many years. Um, and I began to question whether it was right for me to eat animals. Um, and uh, I became vegetarian and later vegan. I got involved in the um, environmental movement and human rights activities, um, went on marches. So it was about a flowering of that an awakening of that level of understanding about things which as I say it was kind of like an instinctive sensitivity that I'd always had and it gave a firmer foundation to it all uh, and that's why when I left university I essentially people would say oh you've got a degree now you know you can do this you can do this and i'd been told i could you know look for a career in the civil service or maybe in teaching neither of which really particularly appealed to me i still wanted to pursue the writing but i i felt that i needed to be honest and truthful to myself and for the first time in my life i was able to say you're telling me i should do this but actually no i'm going to think for myself and do what i think is right for me now and and I did I dropped out of the mainstream the rat races if you like and I went to work in a whole food shop there I was mixing with uh, an incredible group of people writers artists musicians anarchists activists other dropouts intellectuals and it was a like a, a furthering of my education um, 
it felt like the right place. I felt like I'd, I'd, I'd fallen into an environment that for the first time in my life was right. These, these were all people who were in various senses um, misfits, uh, outcasts, um, people who'd chosen not to tread the path that other, uh, you know, the, the, the mainstream path as it were. So it was a very congenial environment to work in. Um, I became involved in um, animal rights activities. I was a hunt saboteur for a few years. Um, and I think there was a, an element of that, which was, I understood what it had been like to be bullied and victimized and marginalized and, and uh, the fear and the anxiety and everything else that went along with that. And I wanted to do something that was kind trying to help others, animals or, you know, human animals as well, um, in, in the same way. Um, so all of that kind of came together in my 30s. It was, it was a, a, a great time. That was one of my best decades. I was still finding a lot of things out. I was still very green, very naive. I still had a lot to learn uh, and catch up on. Um, but I, I um, I started to write as well and, and publish some poetry and some short fiction and I I felt like I'd found myself at last. I was still struggling with other elements. Um, this was the unknown area with uh, autism um, and I began in my mid thirties to have the first sense of uh, mental health problems. I began to get depressions and a uh, doctor, um, I spoke to a doctor and they put me on some antidepressants which didn't seem to work very well. I later found out they don't work very well for autistic people, they don't work at all. And I also saw a therapist and the therapist explained it that it was like my life was catching up with me at last. I'd, I'd, I'd been through all those years of a kind of confusion, a sense of not fitting in, a sense of not really understanding things that I should understand and not really being able to connect with other people. And then I'd been through university and then I'd found this um, life, I'd discovered this this life that path that I wanted to follow and, and that felt right for me. Um, and there were there were conflicts going on in it, you know, because I still had people around me saying, "I'm wasting my degree, I'm wasting my life. I, I should be doing this. I should be doing." It. And I was still, t in some senses, even though I was making my own decisions and deciding what I wanted to do, I was still, in some sense, under the sway of other people's opinions and wanting to please other people. Uh, I was a pe people pleaser for many, many years. Um, still am to some extent because you find it as a way of getting on with people if you can't get on in any other way you try to please them to get them to like you um, so there was still an element of that that I hadn't shaken off and it would take many more years yet but anyway that brings us that's a bit of a recap and that brings us up to uh, my my 30s through my 30s into my late 30s uh, when things began to change again and I'll cover that in the next video thanks for listening